Wait a minute. Mm. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. How y'all doing on this MLK? Uh, birthday day off. I think this might be the, I guess the only tangible benefit from this holiday, people get off from work. And some people went on vacation. But, uh, it won't be back till tonight. And, uh, well, I've written an article about this. And so I guess I'll put some, I guess, verbal words to it. Good morning, Molly. What's up, sweetheart? Ah, it's a nice, brisk. 30 degrees on this uh, January 17th. I'm sure there's some parades and stuff going on this morning. Happy New Year, Molly. Can't wait to see you when I come outside uh, later on this year. I'm not coming outside until like June because uh, I'm not playing with these people. With this, uh, damn, with all this foolishness is going on. They, you know, my people breathing on you and shit. We're not doing that. And so, uh, let me go ahead and talk about this whole MLK thing. It's, where can I start? Because I do one in January and, and well as on his death in April, April 4th. People have these what I call these mindless celebrations. Not really being honored the way it should be, in my opinion. Because I think it would be an honor on a false narrative. You know, this remix narrative they've done of Dr. King. And uh, I just want to start off, let me get right to it. I'm not gonna make this video long. You know, based on how why African Americans were brought to this country, um, it doesn't make sense for an enslaver or a capturer to empower the slaves to escape. Now, they stopped it physically with physical abuse and murder, death, and torture. But then they realized that they couldn't continue to do that. They had to go mental. So let's put together a system where they're always remain in place where they will always be subservient, subservient to the system. So we had to get them mentally. Because that's what this is, a mental game. And they called on a lot of people to help in that. Uh, we had people like Marcus Garvey and Nat Turner and all those folks to either, either Elijah Muhammad and, you know, to break that. But we have a total system, you have a huge machine working on your behalf, you know, it's hard to kind of fight when you're just a few individuals every 10 or 15 years. And so, in the 1930s, they began, like they did with W.E. Du Bois, they had these, this group of, and this is history, y'all, so don't get upset, history of Greek affiliated black men and women and percentage of them were homosexual. You know, there was I'm talking about during the Ralph what say Wilkerson, those guys that went up to uh I guess the president's house, the White House then in the thirties, then they kept it going in the fifties, uh upon the uh the murder of Emmett Till and the black church is the system that was set up to produce or groom this person who would finalize, nail the, put the nail in the coffin of the mental ability of black people to think outside of that systematic box to the point of freedom. Yeah. And Dr. King was birthed, we'll say that. And uh, I think he was given a script 
you know, even though he came out of the church, the church is, was involved in politics of control. So you give a few trinkets to a few Negro preachers and a few others, allies of the system, they look like us, and they participated in it. And so, but they let Dr. King be the face of what they wanted to do. And a lot of those people that are around Dr. King, even though he was a member of Alpha Phi Alpha Fraternity Incorporated, the people around him were Alphas, Qs, and Kappas. They were all black Greeks. And a percentage of them were homosexuals. Y'all remember what I just said. Just keep that in mind. And so, an article that I just wrote on my Facebook page, Rico Opinionated Rivers, I said, Dr. King, I was told about you when I was a little kid. A teenager, I was told about you and what you've done. What you've done. And then as a young adult, I went to college and I was able to read about who you are and have debates and discussions with other college students. Shout out to Grammar State University and those late night dialogues on the, on the steps of the student union on some Friday and Saturday nights, like two or three, one and two o'clock in the morning. We just up there just, they say, just dialoguing. That's what we used to do back in the day, have conversations. And, uh, and then in realizing it hit me because I started learning other stuff about white supremacy and analytical and critical thinking from you know, people like Dr. John Henry Clark and, and Dale Jones and Dr. Amos Wilson. And you know, you start thinking and like, wow, this thing is about control. And Dr. King, unfortunately, and I, and, I, and I say that he was misinformed, he was misled. And his message of nonviolence was pushed on him by black Greeks and homosexuals. And then even when you look at the movies, when, when the Black Panthers and all those folks like, you know what, we need to fight back. And a black Greek or a black homosexual would say, why? What you mean? Fight back. You know they ain't got more guns than us. You know they got more this. But the Haitians, I don't think they had very many guns, but they all gathered together as a group and took care of their business against the French. But that's the kind of stuff that cowards and manipulators put out on the people. You can't do it because they're just going to kill us. Well, let's go back to when they kidnapped the first slaves. There were men and women who jumped over in the Atlantic Ocean before they would be brought over to be slaves. Then you had... Killmonger in the, in the Black America's favorite movie, uh, The Black Panther, he said, let's go ahead, I'd rather die with my ancestors than live as a slave. Dr. Uh, James Brown said, I'd rather die standing up as a man than live on my knees. But see, black manipulators and black cowards who benefit off of black trauma and black submission and black service, so uh, what is it called? Uh, I guess it's been a uh, black servant, servancy to the system. Y'all call them civil rights leaders today, but they were nothing but sellout leaders. They're most of them were black Greeks and black homosexuals. And, and Dr. King pretty much went by that script. We must change a man's heart. We must reach him. You can't reach the devil. That's not how it was. If he can reach the, if we can, if, if the devil was able to be reached, he would have still been in heaven. Come on, somebody. Oh, glory. Instead, he, he was cast out because he's like, no, nah, I'm disagreeable. I don't like this shit. I'm going to do me. And he was cast down. And as he fell down, according to religious folks, what they say in their Bible, as he fell to the earth, he said, that's okay, God. When I get down there, I'm going to have the people you think that's following you following me. And that's what has happened. And Dr. King, bless his heart, y'all keep forgetting he was 16 and 17 and shit, working on a master and PhD. See, he was a young boy. When, they, when, they, when these older black Greeks and church members and deacons and bishops from the black church probably were given a summons by J. Edgar Hoover, whoever, to recruit him as a young boy. And so he's pretty much going along with it. There's even in the movies where one of the prominent homosexuals and black Greeks, uh, uh, Russ, Bayard Rustin, 
was the one who taught Dr. King and not having armed guards to protect him and his family. We don't want to do that now because uh, we want to let them know we got to win with love. And I've never known any other group in the, in the world has ever fought for freedom and they did it with love. They did it with might. They did it with manhood. They did it with womanhood. They didn't do it with love. And so Dr. King was continued to be manipulated because he really thought and he fought tooth and nail to resist the words of Malcolm, to resist the activity of the Black Panthers, to resist Huey P. Newton, to resist Kwame Touré. But it was something else in him. See, God was always trying to get to Dr. King, but the black cowards and the black manipulators were still getting their pockets padded by him pushing that social integration bullshit. Who gains from begging other people, please let me sit next to you. Please let me spend my money with you. I don't care if you poison the food in your restaurant. I just want to sit here because it makes my self-esteem rise. Who does that? No one does that. Except for the, the enslaved Negro in America. So, as Dr. King was noticing, damn, they even shot a president who sounded like he wanted to do a pinch, a little something for black folks. And next thing you know, you know Dev K. Next thing you know, they murdered Malcolm. Because Malcolm, was, you know, got, he was evolving, not just from the white man is the devil, but he was going into uh, international unity of African people, period. Blacks in America, blacks in Venezuela, blacks everywhere. Everywhere, he was pushing for the unity of all black people. And he was also preparing, reportedly, allegedly, to submit a report of inhumane treatment to African Americans, or the Negro back then, to the, U to the UN. And so there were Negroes recruited to pull the trigger. And see, then after uh, that I Have a Dream speech that Dr. King did, after he did that speech, they was pretty much done with him. Because what he did was solidify, they believe, in the minds of Negro Americans, the, the subserviency, that's the word I was looking for earlier, subserviency, and the obedience to the system of racism and white supremacy and the acceptance of third-class citizens. That is what Dr. King was used to do, to put black folks in permanent third-class in this country. Y'all don't believe it? Just go use your brain. I'm going to tell y'all something else that we refuse to accept. Because of your religious belief, because you've been taught one thing, you won't read any other books. Okay, he wrote the letter for the Birmingham jail. Great. He had a lot of time on his hand, like a lot of folks to be put up in jail. They learned a whole lot of stuff while they're in jail. And they got time to write. I'm not saying the letter wasn't significant, but what the hell does it got to do with freedom? and becoming free people, nothing. So, Dr. King, after he said that little black boys, little white girls, and white girls and black boys hanging together and judge me on the content of my character, not the color of my skin, blah, blah, blah. Well, <laughs> that's all the enslaved Negro wanted. Well, well, that's what they trained them because, you know, we are been trained through Jesus Christ, we need to love everybody. <laughs> and not fight for yourself. I mean, brutal, get into a brutal fight. Imagine had Americans bucked up and armed up and fought tooth and nail to the battle and just fought bloody in the 1950s and 60s. Imagine what we'd be today. They literally gave up their lives for a reason. Instead of being, had milkshakes thrown in their faces and shit and dogs sicked on them and all that. But instead, they were actually getting them shotguns and them guns shooting as many as they could. That would have made world news. That would have made people come to the table. You can't come to the table out here to kick somebody's ass. They, hey, well, well, at least can you give us some kind of bonus rights? <laughs> See, after 1963, that I have a dream speech. They were done with Dr. King. And I haven't read his book, but from what I understand, Tavis Smiley pretty much wrote all this down, right? And it's called The Death of a King, the last year of Dr. Martin Luther King's life. How really black Americans were hating him. 
because this is when I say God entered his life. Like he entered Nat Turner's life, like he entered Malcolm's life. He started talking about reparations. And that's what that I Have a Dream speech was about, reparations. He said a blank check returned or marked insufficient funds. He was talking about in his speech, you promised black folks a check for repair for all that you've done. And you, you, wrote, a, you wrote a rubber check. And it came back stamped insufficient funds. That was the basis of the I Have a Dream speech. We don't teach black children this. We don't teach the world this. Because corporate America has branded Dr. King. No love each other. While they still, they're still living on top, they're still living the best life, and we still have these black ghettos. We still have black men and black women being a, a disproportionately attacked and incarcerated, particularly black boys and black men, by the system. And y'all want to talk about some fucking Dr. King? That old Dr. King. I never cared for that Dr. King. The Dr. King I cared for when I started doing my research was the 1966 to 68 Dr. King when he woke up and he started speaking out against, which would be the death knell for him, white man's money, which was the Vietnam War. He said, yeah, I wanted jobs for our people, but I didn't mean for you to use the draft to the goddamn Vietnam War as employment. And he talked about brutality over there. Then he talked about how they gave interest-free loans to white farmers, but acting like black folks couldn't get nothing. Black farmers. There's a video going around about that, but none of you ever shared that with your classrooms. You never shared that speech when he's talking about really reparations and black independence. And that's why I say he was misled and misinformed. And towards the end, when God actually entered Dr. King's life, that's when it was time for him to go. Because those same black Greeks, black homosexuals, black preachers are all in one and the same a lot of times. They all begged him, Dr. King, please, don't talk about that. We's doing good. We always got good jobs. They're going to be all right. They're going to get a sanitation worker's a job. They're going to they give them a raise of 50 cents. Don't do that. Don't do that, Dr. King. Don't get involved in all that. That's too black. We need to be on the good white folks' side. That's what they were saying in their articulate, educated, Ph.D., master's degree, B.A., bachelor of arts degree language. And so towards the end, Dr. King was frustrated and it probably felt used and misled and all of that because he was. But it was too late. You know, in that last speech, that mountaintop speech, you can tell he said, shit, I mess around fuck with these weirdos and my people around here look crazy. And I'm going to tell you our result of that. Look, at we've integrated. We still don't have shit. I mean, not only do we not have anything, we don't even have the mental wherewithal to get it. And it's right in front of us. That's the mind fuckery that was cemented after the, during the civil rights movement. And so y'all have to forgive me when I tell you I don't give a damn if all of them, John Lewis and anybody else, all these old Negro civil rights, I don't give a damn if all of them passed out today. They were the biggest sellouts of our race. And then you got these Al Shoptons and these Angela Rides and Mika Mallory motherfuckers running around here. Like they're on some real civil rights shit. They're not. Because they're on some feminist, womanist, um, uh, multicultural integration bullshit that still doesn't help us. So, Dr. King, rest in peace, brother. Happy birthday. You know, we see it, and it's a shame that instead of them telling you to fight for human rights, they made you, they tricked you into fighting for some stupid shit called civil rights. Why the fuck would you need civil rights if you're a full American? That's for immigrants. <laughs> Shit's crazy. So, but anyway, uh, even today they're fighting over you. Democrats are fighting over damn. Voting bill. Who the fuck needs a voting bill that's supposed to be a full America? I want y'all to ponder in that. When y'all, when they letting y'all fight over some goddamn voting rights. And we're supposed to be full American. Y'all help me make that make sense. Holla at y'all. Y'all enjoy your day off. This is your man Rico. Peace.